How's it going everyone? We're running late today. Meg is actually still cooking, so we'll have that here shortly. But it is the, I believe, well, getting some Okay, so it's the 11th episode of Murder, She Ate, which is exciting. There's a lot of you guys that seem like you're diehard loving this. There's also some people that seem like they don't really like this much at all. And let me know if the audio is good and everything. And basically what we do is we eat a keto dinner, but that's pretty much all there is to be said for keto. We'll answer some keto questions if possible, but it's mostly about telling stories Crime stories, murders, disappearances, maybe conspiracies and like cult stuff, but we've never really done that yet. But we might get to that at some point too. And we each tell a case. So I tell one, Mega tells one. And I'm pulling up the chat here. So we filmed some recipe videos today. We got some good ones. We actually did a chicken pot pie recipe, which is just like a classic Midwestern dish. And it's really good. So I think you guys will like that. So I had to run to pick up Julius and pick up ingredients for dinner and I just got back at like 526. So Meg is trying to somehow throw it all together right now. So what's new guys? YouTube finally sent me a notification when you all went live. So I put up the schedule, the scheduled live stream like in the, I try doing it in the morning on Wednesdays, but usually it's like between noon and 2 p.m. And then you can click set reminder and you'll get reminded as soon as the live stream starts. Also, I think there's a bell you can click on our YouTube channel. So what's going on, guys? My favorite night of the week is Murder, She Ate. Oh, we appreciate it. <laughs> Hello from Minnesota. Hello from Arizona. Grocery shopping right now. Sounds fun. Your eyes look so heavy, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Doing fine, a little tired. How do you have tips for us weed smokers for munchies? Hmm. So, here's one tip. You cook yourself up a nice little meal, and then as you sit down with your meal in front of you, you smoke a little weed and then you eat. Then maybe you have a few snacks on the side, like some pork rind, string cheese, things like that. Have like a plan going into, going into things that can help. Where's Mega? She's coming soon. I hear the bowls being dished up right now. You didn't give up his leash, he's so sad. I didn't have time. So we just picked up Julius, he was at daycare today. Having my last keto cheat meal before I start the summer shred challenge, Quest Chip Nachos. Yeah, so the, there is a summer shred thing. If you guys, there's a series of videos we did at the start of last year where we did a 90 day cut. So we actually have a coach now that's running another 90 day cut. So if you guys wanna sign up, it starts March 1st, deeperstateketo.com. And you have to use the code summer shred to get entered into the whole thing. And you actually get like, um, a messaging apps uh, with the coach so we can like kind of help you along the way. Did you get a prenup? Mm, should, should, can I disclose that? Why would you get one? We didn't get one, but we're 50-50 in our business, so I didn't really see a reason why, why we need one. I know people say you always need one. Our yeah, so I don't feel like we need one, but I don't know. I didn't honestly look into it too much. I guess you just make the common mistake everyone makes. You like think you're super in love and then 10 years later you're getting divorced and you're like, oh, I wish I had a prenup. You want fork or knife? Fork. fork knife. And I want a little, uh, a little ghee or coconut oil too. The website for the summer shred is deeperstateketo.com. I'll type it in chat right now. Use the coupon code Summer Shred. And I know a lot of you said you like the ambiance better in the kitchen. Uh, you replaced me? Yeah. She's literally sitting on my placemat. Oh, this is a big bowl. I know. Big meals. So, we for dinner we have egg roll in a bowl. 
Which, Beautiful um, presentation, too. And we've already eaten this once on Murder, She Ate. But that just goes to show we really love this meal. Yeah. Like the Asian flavor, and then it's just like some cabbage and meat. So it's like... We have a recipe on our food block, right? Yeah. Like easy on the digestion, super delicious, different from a steak. We love it. Oh, Julius. What, what are you guys having for dinner tonight? I'm going to link this recipe in chat too if you guys want to try making it. This is like one of our faves for sure. It's like the best Asian recipe we have. No. No? Cashew chicken. Mega says cashew chicken is. Do you like the Quest Ranch chips? Good macros? Yeah, the macros are pretty good. They're not my favorite though. I like the, the nacho cheese ones better. Love egg roll in a bowl. Fam loves it. Carrot pad thai. That's what you're having for dinner. So that's like pad thai using carrots as noodles. That sounds good. Stuffed salmon. Dang, you guys are cooking it up out there. Red wine and string cheese. <laughs> I know what kind of night you're having. Actually like a fun night. I'm assuming you're watching TV of some kind. You're like just kicking it on the porch. You know what is underrated and it seems like it's kind of fading in our modern society here is like just hanging out on the porch. Drinking, maybe like a neighbor walks by, you chat with them for a little bit. Like we used to play out in the front yard and my parents would sit on the porch. It seems fun. We don't do it much anymore. Can you eat too much protein? Of course, you can eat too much of anything. You can drink too much water. Um, but like most, for most people I would say it's not that big of a concern, too much protein. It's kind of hard to overdo it. The only case that it really, comes into play as maybe when you're first starting and you're just focusing on removing all the carbs and if you're not making any effort to add fat then it could be kind of tough to to eat fat because fat is pretty hard to find in our food supply these days someone just said the cure for keto rash is milk thistle and turmeric interesting i haven't heard that i know milk thistle supposedly helps with like liver liver stuff liver support My childhood home has a porch. My husband and I are looking for a house at the moment and a front porch is a must have. So one interesting thing that I didn't know was a must have until we started looking for houses and then I realized it was, is a basement. Because not a lot of homes in Georgia have basements. Does everyone get the keto rash? No, it's a pretty small percentage of people and I don't really know why. I honestly haven't looked into it all that much. How's it going guys? Mega's here finally. Well, who knew you were going to go to the furthest grocery? That's so a good question. You're just going to go to the one right around the corner. Well, I picked up Julius. Yeah. Do you need, why do you need a basement? Well, it's cooler in the summer. It's, I guess maybe it's like a man thing and I didn't think I was someone who would just kind of fall into all these stereotypes, but I like just going down there, escaping, having my dungeon. Yeah, we, I nice. grew up with a basement in all my homes and the kids always play down there. It's easy to just like seclude the kids down there. You usually have like a theater room and like your bar, if you have a bar, or like a pool table, like it's just a good hangout spot, I feel like. How much meat did you give me? I don't know. How much total meat did you do? One and a half pounds. Okay. So like 12 ounces at least. Yeah. Okay. What else did you add to this? Cabbage. I just loaded up on cabbage too. I'm going to try making homemade sauerkraut this week. Coconut aminos, rice wine vinegar, fresh garlic, fresh ginger. Oh, you chopped it up fresh? Yeah. Some sesame oil, a very little at the end. I don't usually cook with it. Like I don't put it down first. Um, I don't like to heat it through too much. So I just drizzle it on at the end and then I mix it in. And salt and pepper. Nice. Not a lot, not a lot of ingredients. What are we drinking tonight? I got water, do you, what do you want me to get you? Nothing. I think we should start cases though. It's 5.43 already. Okay. What baby? Yeah, we have a baby on the way, guys. 
Yeah. Do carb ups break a stall? There's some thinking that maybe it could. I don't know what would really be at play to where carb ups break your stall, but maybe even you could just try like one high calorie day, like one point five x your calories, because when you're doing but like keto, yeah, you could try that first. That's maybe what I would try first. But when you're doing just a calorie deficit for such a long period of time, your metabolism starts dropping and it does get tough to continue losing weight. Okay, one bite, because I'm pregnant. Matthew Newbold's here. And then I What's will up, start my case. Got our meeting tomorrow. I'm ready for you. Okay. Mm. It's hot. Okay. The baby will be beautiful. Do you guys think? Meg is beautiful. I don't necessarily know that I'm beautiful, though. Yeah. We talk about that. <laughs> like, I mean, do two good-looking people always make good-looking babies? And, like, is Matt considered objectively very good-looking? No. But I have certain good-looking <laughs> attributes. Like, I'm 6'3". <laughs> you're smart. You're funny. You are blue eyes. You have yeah. nice lips. Really just the nose. The nose? It's just okay. like the one standout feature that like maybe... Your eyes are big. My eyes are like definitely a weak point. You're My not... eyes are really small, just not not noticeable, kind of boring, bland. Okay. I'm going to start my case. So Okay, let's do it. So as I was doing my case, I kind of like, I didn't do a ton of research because we were like pressed for time. Sorry. Oh, gosh. We were pressed for time, so I went with the first one that I came across, and I was just like, I'm not even going to, like, really no. do digging. Down, down, boy. So this reminded me of a case, like, Matt would present, and so I was like, ah, I'm not that satisfied with it, but I'm going to go with it because I've done all the research. You're going to lead with that. you got to sell it highly. Hype it up. Yeah, but, like, it just... Woo, Laureen! She's Laureen, missing! Laureen we got Ron. this! So, this is the uh, disappearance of Laureen Ran. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, we'll just, we'll go ahead and start. So, Laureen was 14 years old when she went missing on the 26th of April in 1980 in Manchester, New Hampshire. So, 1980. 14-year-old in 1980. The year really tells you a lot. Yeah, because back then, whenever you hear cases from this time period, it's like, we used to leave our doors unlocked at night. Yeah, it's literally like, yeah, how, how all those cases go. <laughs> Homebodies uh, Adventures just donated $5. Says Julius and his sweater. Smiley, I mean, heart eyes. Heart eyes. Yeah, he's the cutest. Okay, um, yeah, you, a lot of people say they're confused. This is crime stories. We're telling crime stories, yeah. not keto stuff, guys. Wednesday nights, 5.30 p.m. Eastern, we do only crime. And we answer some keto questions, if you're willing to stick around. So Laureen was five foot four. She had blue eyes, brown hair, and she was 90 pounds. So she was, she was small, smaller person. Um, she also, and she lived in an apartment on the third floor with her mom and her mom's boyfriend at the time was a professional tennis player. Mm. So he would travel, he would go to his games and Judith, the mom and Laureen, they would usually travel with him. So there was one tournament um, that was only a day long, so the mom would be back later in the night, like around midnight. And Laureen asked her mom, she was like, hey, can I just stay at home, just hang out with some friends, you know, call some friends over. And the mom was like, hey, it's, you know, it's one day, sure. Totally fine. So Laureen spent the evening with two friends, drinking beer, just like hanging out. At age 14? Yeah. In 1980, though, that was normal. That seems like not great parenting. I know... Well, she was a single parent. She traveled with her yeah. boyfriend a lot. Like, I, that, you know. 14 is definitely borderline. Like, 16, yeah, I'm doing that all day. But, like, 14 is, what is that? Like, ninth? that's like maybe ninth grade, eighth or ninth grade? I think if, you're, if you grew up in a city, though, it's more normal. I could see that. Okay. 14 is fine. <laughs> what do you guys think? Is 14 okay to spend the night home alone? Oh, spend the night home alone or drink beer? I was talking spend the night home alone. Oh, I spend the night home alone 14. Okay. Well, drinking beer, no, of course. But it, well, you, you have to know I, that... I didn't know what you're talking about. You have to know that there's the chance that they're going to drink beer <coughs> when they're home alone. No. At 14, it's totally fine to stay home. Like, our child could stay home alone at 14. Okay. I would think. Some people saying no, 14's still young. Really? It seems so old. 14-year-olds babysit like little kids. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Going back to the story. So, Lorraine spent the night... 
like I said, just at home with two friends. And one was a male, one was a female, but their identities were never disclosed since they're underage. Makes total sense. So when Judith arrived home that night around midnight for, from the tennis tournament, she found all the light bulbs in the hallway. Like, that's how she returned home. So I don't know they're if she... On? No, they were unscrewed slightly, so they couldn't Whoa. be turned on. Yeah, so... That's scary. It, it, okay. was, it was a dark hallway right off the bat. And um, the front door of her apartment was unlocked. So the male friend actually had heard Judith coming down the hallway. So he escaped. Like, he, he ran out of the back door, escaped down the fire escape. And then Judith is a mom? Judith is a mom. Okay. And then the male friend, when he was questioned after Lorene had went missing, he said that he heard Lorene lock the back door after he left. So... She locked the back door, didn't lock the front door, but either way, like that's his account. Okay, wait. <clears throat> so when the mom gets home, who's home? No one? We're about to get to that. Okay. So this, so that was the boy's account. Mm -hmm. He left. So when Judith comes into the house, she peeks inside of Lorraine's room to make sure she's there sleeping and someone's in the bed. So she's like, all right, Lorraine's home. She's sleeping. That's fine. But it wasn't until the next morning that the female friend was the one that actually came out of the bedroom. And she had mentioned that Loreen fell asleep on the couch. So she was in the bedroom and that's who the mom actually saw. Okay. The friend. So are we thinking she's pretty drunk? Who? The friend who's just sleeping in a bed. In her friend's bed? Yeah. Why would she be pretty drunk? Weren't they drinking beers? Yeah. But what do you mean? Like her, fr like if your friend Tarek falls asleep on the couch, you go sleep, crash in his bed, right? Okay. If you don't have yeah. anywhere else to sleep, yeah. so it makes total sense. Yeah, I've definitely done that. So the the thing that was weird was that Lorraine's brand new shoes, as well as her clothes and her bag, were all in the living room, but no, she wasn't anywhere to be found that morning when the mom like realizes that you know her friend was in her room and not actually Lorraine. Mary Baptiste, thank you for the donation, $10. Um, so the police off the bat pinned Laureen as just a classic runaway case. She's 14 and they believe that she just left intentionally. So it doesn't make sense to leave in this scenario though. Right. Like having she, fun with friends. And she had like, she had a good, like there was no claimed issues with her mom or like any of her school or anything. Someone just said, hey, thought you guys should know this channel changed my life. I'm down 65 pounds. Yay. So, um, the police don't take it seriously at first, but the mom obviously believes that, um, she would never leave without her bag. So like she did definitely didn't leave intentionally. She would take her bag if she was going to leave for a while or even forever, right? Like you don't leave your bag behind. Yeah. Um, and then after many months had passed, so that was in April and now it's October, Judith discovered that three phone calls had been char charged to her home home line in Cal from California. So in 1980, the call, you could like call, so I could call from your house somewhere else, but charge it to my home line via operator. So call the operator, be like, hey, can you charge it to my home phone, give the number, and then call somewhere else if you can't afford it. So. Does the home phone that you're charging it to have to confirm this though? They have to give it the okay, right? No, I, I guess you don't. Yeah, you could do weird phone stuff back in the day. You didn't even, yeah, I remember. It was great. I remember there was all these like psychic hotlines you could call. Not that I lived in the 1980, but I'm sure it was even weirder then. So there were three calls that had been charged to the home from California. And the calls were from motels in Santa Monica and Santa Ana. And then the third call was to a teen sexual assistance hotline. So, like, right at this point, we're thinking sex trafficking, right? Or something, like, is going on. Maybe Laureen, if, if the calls are legitimately from her, something sexually is going on. That's, okay. That's a problem. First off, they're in what state? Are they, they are, in California? No, they're in New Hampshire. Okay. So, my first thought is not necessarily sex trafficking. Are we assuming someone came into the house and took her? I don't know what we're assuming. But I'm just going based off of these calls at this point. Okay, based off the calls. Cause, so, there's a few things. Like, the unscrewed light bulbs, that's really weird. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the fact that there's, like, another girl in the bed that is ripe for the taking. Mm -hmm. That's just untouched. So, why was And it then there's also the boy who 
Like, I don't know what his account is. I'm not jumping right to he sex left. trafficking right away. I think there might be foul play within the house. But if we're believing the accounts at this point, just the sexual teen sexual assistance hotline, all three calls are charged to the home line, and it's right after Lorraine's gone missing. So my, I think the general assumption is, is that it was Lorraine calling, looking for help in some way, right? Okay, sure. So they're coming from motels, and one of them goes to a sexual assistance hotline. Okay. That's just, you know, general thinking. We can break this down later. So when the three calls happen, the police start to take the, um, start to take the case more seriously, and they look into the calls themselves. So the call to the teen sexual assistance hotline was accepted by a physician, but when questioned, he had no re recollection of Lorene or any call of the nature where it could be connected to Lorene. But then five years later in 1985, he changed his story saying, you know, sometimes his wife took in runaway girls and one of them may have been from New Hampshire. So I don't know. That's weird. No. Yeah. But like I'm putting no weight in that. Why why all of a sudden the five years would he yeah. be like, I want to be invested in this case? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I didn't really think much of it. But he's fielding that. calls like that all day, right? I would imagine. Like that's part of his job. Yeah. I think maybe five years of like maybe guilt or something or like he's not as with his wife anymore. But like when a woman when they're taking in like runaways, that doesn't seem very like safe. But what are they taking the runaways in for? You know, why wouldn't yeah. they just like report it or call the police and be like, This is a person who's run away? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I still don't put much into it. So he claimed okay, so and then he also claimed that his wife with a woman named his wife was doing it with a woman named Annie Sprinkle, who was involved, who was found to be involved in the porn industry, but there was never any true connection found between Annie, the porn industry person, and the case itself. So that was just like a wash, like nothing really came of that. So in 1986, a year later, Judith, the mother, hired a private investigator to go to California and check out the motels and it was found that one of the motels was said to be a location where some child pornography videos were made by a man called Dr. Z. But again, no connection like really made to the case. Nothing really came of it, but it's just like kind of like interesting if you're thinking, you know, like the sexual trafficking from the get go. And then it's like the pornography is, comes up kind of twice. I feel like we're putting a lot of eggs in the basket of the phone calls at this point when it's strongly possible that, like, you can just... It's those, also, those have nothing to do with it. Yeah, but it's just a very strong coincidence, right? Yeah. Like, hi. Hi. Oh, him up. He hasn't seen when us I'm all day. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, for a long time after Lauren's disappearance, Judith would even, like, she received phone calls around 3.45 a.m., but no one would ever be on the other end. She couldn't hear, like, voices anyone you know breathing yeah. um and she would even receive a lot of these calls around the holiday period so judith you know when she would get these calls she was assuming that they were lorraine so she would just talk to the phone as if it were lorraine yep. um and like i was trying to think is there an instance in which lorraine could call and she couldn't say anything or like she couldn't speak and her mom wouldn't hear and then she would just wanted to like hear her mom's voice and get comfort if she's like actually somewhere mm -hmm. like captured see no i don't think it makes sense if she's captured i think it makes sense if she ran away on her own volition and then she's like man i kind of miss my family but i like my new life but i still want to hear my mom's voice maybe that would happen yeah maybe um so one of laureen's friends childhood friends named Roger receives a call to his home and it's actually his mom who picks up the phone. And the woman on the other end says she's either Lori or Laureen. It's not really like able to be pulled. Like you can't really hear exactly what she's saying. Mm -hmm. And she says that she used to be one of Roger's girlfriends, but no link really found. This woman's never actually identified. So at this point, like, I don't know, like what's, what is, even to make of these calls you know we have no real hard evidence at all i know so far that's the thing about this case 
Daddy Warbox donates ten dollars. Thank you for this channel. It has truly changed my life for the better. Wow, thank, thank you. you. Daddy. That's amazing. We appreciate it. Daddy Warbox, that's from is that from Annie or something? Oh, I don't know. Oh, buddy. Um so, you know, at the end, you know, Judith really really just was always believing that Laureen was alive is alive and that the original three calls that were charged to the home were from Laureen. Okay. Classic parent thinking. And the calls she received stopped only after Judith obviously remarried. She moved to Southern California, I believe, and then she changed her number. So like, you know, once her numbers changed, the calls stopped. So that, I don't know, like that's, I don't know. I guess it, I don't know, because I feel like this case wasn't really publicized. So it's not like someone knew that Laureen was missing and then they got the phone, home phone number and they wanted to just be a prankster. Is that all the info we have? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so why it's like your case of your, your case. Yeah, I see what you mean. So, I mean, the hardest pieces of but, evidence. But the mom, just a couple things. The mom, okay. the one thing she did believe was that the two friends with Laureen that night knew more about what happened and just aren't saying anything. But the male friend... Are is, they older or are they her same age? I think they're... We don't know. We, I mean, they're underage is the most we know. Um... Uh, but the male friend in 1985, he actually commits suicide and is never really considered a suspect. Um, but like on Reddit, there was lots of talk of, you know, he committed suicide because of the guilt he felt with what happened to no. Lorraine. But like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons you would commit suicide and like, it's just, it's just a theory out there. So the, the th theories that are actually possible is that she did leave on her own accord to meet a female, like to meet a male friend and she was abducted on her way or, you know, at some point or someone entered the apartment and kidnapped her. But why didn't the other friend get taken? Which is what you said. And then the third was that she was talking to someone she was involved with, maybe the reason why she wanted to stay home alone that night. And that person was involved in sex trafficking. And like, when she went to meet that person, you know, something happened. So nothing really speaks to the, her leaving alone though, like her leaving on her own accord. Like why would she leave intentionally, you know? Yeah. So I think just on the hardest evidence we actually have to me, the unscrewed light bulbs. Yeah. Miley always knocks stuff off of the counters and then Julius eats them. Yeah. So he just like eats, eats pens all day. Let me make sure it's not, not bad. really, but, um, so yeah, the three light bulbs that makes me think foul play, right? It has to mean foul play. So, and then that would mean someone entered the home, unless it was the kid. Let's get some theories going here. What do you guys think? Do you want anything to drink? Oh, I'll get something in a minute. So the weirdest thing to me is the light bulbs. Yeah. They're unscrewed. And why? And has this been confirmed by the mom that that's just not how she left it for some reason? She wouldn't unscrew all the light bulbs in the hallway leading up to her apartment. Oh, outside? Oh, it's outside. The lights are outside. Okay. That changes things. Why would... So that makes me think someone doesn't want to be seen that's leaving the house with a woman, with the girl, basically. Yeah. I don't know. There's honestly not enough data on this case to really make a solid guess of what could have happened. Yeah. So either she was kidnapped from the home. Yeah. Or she um, just left. It doesn't really make sense that she would leave because she's having a fun party night. Well, she's either. I'm, I'm pretty sure she didn't leave on her own. So she, either she was kidnapped and now she's dead or she was kidnapped and now she's in sex trafficking. I think these are the most realistic things. Yeah. Because there was really no reason for her to leave on her own. So I'm pretty staunch on that part. Um, so, yeah. What do you guys think? If she ran away, she could have unscrewed the light bulbs herself just to make it suspicious. It would be a pretty adolescent move. It just... It, Do you need a ladder, though? Like, I'm wondering if she could even reach them. Are, like, how many kids a year run away? A decent amount. But how many, you know? I don't know what the number is, but it seems like it's really high because it's always an option in these cases. Well, most people that run away... It's more of like a cry for help. Like they're of course coming back and it's just that type of thing. It's very rare that they actually run away 
successfully start a new life for themselves at age 14. That almost never happens. So we're just assuming even if she did run away on her own, she's dead right now? I don't know. I, I don't really have a solid guess. Matthew Newbold says, or a neighbor in the apartment unscrewed the light bulbs because they were shining in their apartment. Yeah, like they were bothering under the door of people's houses. Yeah. This one basically just vanished and there's not a lot of evidence. How was your meal? Good, really good. Mm. Yeah, I kept thinking back to her friends, like maybe they did something. Yeah. And like that's why the boy supposedly left and he had his, she locked the door on the way out just to make it so that it felt like Laureen was actually at the house. Yeah. But would they, then they and would, then the sister and then the female friend pretended to be her sleeping in her bed in case the mom checked. That makes the most sense because I mean, the simplest answer is usually the right one, right? So she's doing something really abnormal, having friends over, staying at home alone until midnight. Mm -hmm. Something bad mm -hmm. happens to me. It's a lot less likely some yeah. crazy person enters the home, puts her into sex trafficking, the other girl's just sleeping in bed. It's more likely something bad happened that night that someone's just trying to cover up. Yeah, I agree. So I guess that's what I would go with. Probably the guy. Yeah. Where's your ring? My wedding ring? Yeah. Oh, it's, well, my engagement ring is upstairs. Uh, Sylvia says, don't think she'd run away, especially if her mom lets her have sleepovers and drink. Usually runaways are rebelling due to strict parents. Yeah, I'd agree. It's true, too. Okay, I'm going to grab something to drink. That is my story. Let's see. Rapin killed her after her friend passed out from the booze. Then he gave the she locked the door story. Yeah, it's... It's crazy how common things like that seem to be. So I think with like all the people saying things like, did they investigate the neighbors or fingerprints on the light bulbs? I mean, the cops didn't take it seriously at first. It wasn't until after a very long time, months, that they took it seriously, like six months. So at that point, you know, a lot of what maybe the neighbors recall or what evidence they could have had is now disrupted you know hm doc 261 five dollars thank you for everything because of you guys i've lost over 75 pounds wow it's amazing congratulations keep killing it oh we got perrier's yeah i bought them lemon oh did you got flavor too? You want up? No, I just got lemon. And I got, I've been having these for dessert, these nut butter packets. It's RX uh, nut butter. Did you get this donation? Yeah. So it's RX nut butter. Um, they, it's, they add a half of a date to it. So there's a little bit more added sugar than typical. And there's more protein. Cause it's yeah, an egg there's white. an egg white too, but it's also more volume and just kind of more satisfying to me. So I do like these. It's uh, so it's seven total carbs, two fiber, three sugar. So it's five net carbs and it's a little over two tablespoons worth. Okay, you guys ready for my story? I wanna what, get a berry. Let's drink water. Was it her boyfriend or was it just a random guy that they're friends We don't know, just two friends. Okay, okay guys, this is the story of Stacy Castor. And it is a twisting, a winding story. A lot of twists and turns along the way. This could be made into a Hollywood movie. Okay, so Stacy met her husband in 1985 and they got married shortly after. Her husband's name is Michael. And Michael had drinking problems, some drug use, it seemed like recreational, like nothing too hard going on. And he didn't become a good husband until after the birth of their daughter. This is kind of what she said. Like he was still living a single, like partying kind of lifestyle until their daughter was born. Okay. Ashley is the first daughter. And then he settled down and he eventually became a good father. I feel like that's a lot of people. 
two daughters. One is born in 1987 and one in 1991. Ashley and Bree. Ashley is more important for this story. She's the one we got to, to know about. But they're both equally important children. Yeah. So problems start arising in the marriage a few years after the children are born. In 1999, Michael starts getting sick. This is the husband. He seems like he's oh, drunk. Man. You spilled? Yeah. He seems like he's drunk all the time, even though he claims he is not, and he's always nauseated. And, you know, I can see this being the case because he has a drinking problem. So maybe you would think he's just concealing his drinking problem, saying he's not drunk, but he really is. Yeah, I mean, that's denial. Drunks so, are denial. So yeah, the family thinks he's actually just drunk. Okay. They suggest that he goes to see a doctor if there is actually something wrong with him, but he never gets around to doing that. And a few weeks later, Michael is found dead at home. Hmm. He was at home with Wait, Ashley. Wait, the husband? Yeah. Oh. Michael is found dead. So he's complaining about being drunk or like feeling drunk. Mm. And he dies a few weeks later. Uh, he is at home at the time of his death with one of his daughters, Ashley. How old is she at the time? She is 11. Okay. And she doesn't think anything serious is wrong. He apparently started making strange faces and then just kind of like passed out. And the fact that she doesn't think anything's wrong with that to me is like this is standard operating procedure. Like he's drinking on the couch every night. Probably just don't really pay him too much mind. Like he just does his thing, you know? Oh, that's smart. I was like, maybe she's just really dumb. <laughs> like a dumb no. old, she's not educated. Yeah. Um... Stacy and her mother eventually arrive at the house and notice something is wrong. So this is Stacy, the wife of Michael, okay. and her mother, grandmother, like you know, her mother, the whatever, grandmother. yeah, the grandmother. Um, they immediately say, "Whoa, something's wrong here." They notify police. He's taken to the hospital. They attempt to revive Michael, the husband, but he is pronounced dead of a heart attack at 38 years old. Mm -hmm. So 38 year old heart attacks. That's pretty rare. Yeah. It's not unheard of, but it is quite rare. Stacy is asked if she would like an autopsy since it was such a young age to die of a heart attack. She declines. And I don't really see too much of a problem with that. Uh -huh. Do you? I'm getting everything. You are? You if I actually autopsy? love the man? And like, I mean, does it cost money to get the autopsy? I think, no, it's just state would do it for you. Yeah, I would get it for sure. Okay. You would? See, I don't know that I... So people are already Whoa. ruining it for me if it's true. <laughs> they found out what he did and they poisoned him slowly. Everyone was in agreement that no autopsy was needed, except for Michael's sister, the, the husband who died's sister. She said she noticed like his upper body was all purple looking and it looked weird to her, so she wanted an autopsy. But Good. everyone else didn't want one, so they didn't do one. Okay. Even Michael's mom was like, no, it's fine. So he wasn't like well-liked? I don't know if that's the case. I think they just didn't see any need for it. What do you mean? Because he died of a heart attack. The medical people said it was a heart attack. Yeah, but if he, if you supposedly think he's a drunk, wouldn't you want the autopsy to confirm that like there was alcohol in his system or something? I think, what if there was alcohol? What would that confirm, though? That, like, it contributed to it. He drank all the time. Just because it's in your system doesn't mean it contributed to it. Yeah, but he was denying he was drinking. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess you could. Uh, you can go either way, yeah. I guess you could get the autopsy. Yeah. So Stacy, the wife, collects 50000 life insurance policy, which she uses for a funeral and to help start a new life with her two daughters. Fifty k to me, is not, it's not kill-worthy, right? Like no. you're not killing someone for fifty k. But like, what was their life like? Did they have money? Um, they were doing fine. They didn't have a ton of money, no. Okay, so maybe fifty k is a lot for them. Middle class family. Maybe I don't know what his job was. Did they have loans or debt? No. Okay. Nothing too outstanding about their finances. Okay. Stacy gets a tattoo on her shoulder of a teddy bear with angel wings sitting on a cloud to commemorate her husband, Michael. That's weird. Is it? Wouldn't you get a tattoo if I died? Uh, well, I guess I want to know what the teddy bear signifies. But yeah, that's not weird that she got a tattoo. But What would you get a tattoo of if I died? Um, young thug. Why would you get that for me? I don't know. It's like one of the first musicians we bonded over, really. Okay. 
So at this time, the kids are 11 and 8. And then three years later... Wait, so did they get the autopsy report? No, there's no autopsy done. So the sister done. wanted it. But it's the, not mother, like the, the mother rules. and the wife both said no. Um, they do. Okay. So uh, three years later, Stacey begins dating one of her bosses, David Castor. Three years seems appropriate to me. How long do you start dating someone after your husband dies? I think... I mean, you would have think, to know their love relationship. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think a year is fine. I think a year. A year is fine, yeah. No. Three years later, they begin dating. David Castor is this guy's name. This is her boss. Heating and cooling company boss. Uh, yeah, heating and cooling. They shared a love for cars, ATVs, and jet skis. Apparently, they were just like all the time fixing up cars, buying ATVs, riding jet skis together. That's what they bonded over. Stacy and David. Okay. So was he making money? He was making a good living compared to Stacy's last husband. Okay. So Stacy's daughters were not too happy about David because the thing with David was he had a wife, he had a kid. He's kind of like done with all that. He wants to just do his thing with Stacy now. He doesn't want children really. So the two added kids to him, that's a big negative. How he, old are they? They're 11 and 8. Or no, now at this time they're 14 and 11. So still really young. Yeah. But he apparently, like, face-to-face, -face, he's like, I'm not your dad, guys. Don't think of me as a dad. I'm just here, like, to hang. I get it. I get it, but it's, like, really bad judgment from the mother. Like, yeah, you like, she shouldn't be with someone no, like that. No, exactly. And then David did have one child from a previous marriage also. So David spends a lot of money on his hobby. Some would say an obscene amount of money, like, outside of his means. Just always buying jet skis, ATVs, that type of stuff. He's really into it. David and Stacy eventually get married. And like with all marriages, small fights start to happen. Mm -hmm. But the, the topic of fighting is always the same. It's about Stacy wanting to bring her kids along and David wanting to just have Stacy there. How is Stacy's obviously just a terrible person? Mm -hmm. I would agree. So it culminates one night when it's their anniversary and Stacy, they want to go to an amusement park. Stacy wants to bring the youngest daughter, Bree, along. Okay. David's not having it. They're going to an amusement park yeah. and they can't bring the kids. Apparently. So David's just not having it. They get in a really long fight. Um, apparently it ends when David says, get away from me. And then Stacy just leaves the room and that's the end of the fight right there. Doesn't sound like that's probably how it happened. She's like, get away from me. She's like, okay. <laughs> but uh, the next day, Stacy shows up to work and David's not there. So this is odd because they live together and they work together. I'd imagine they drive to work together, but apparently they didn't. But when you're fighting, you take several cars. Yeah, sure. So she's not there, or he's not at work. So Stacy calls the house to check on him. There's no answer. Mm -hmm. At 2 p.m., she calls in a welfare check on him. So that's when you like call the police. To go oh. check and like knock I on the door. I thought she was collecting his welfare check from the government. No. I was like, what? No, she calls the cops to basically go check and make sure everything's okay. <laughs> uh, at Okay, so a sergeant goes into her house, enters the house, approaches the bedroom door where David is, apparently. Mm -hmm. Can hear a TV on, but no one responds. He continues to knock. Eventually, he breaks through the locked door. He finds David unresponsive, face down, naked on the bed with vomit everywhere. Some notable items that are in the room. There's cranberry juice, a bottle of it, a bottle of brandy, and a bottle of antifreeze. So at this point, are you assuming that this was all done before she left or after she left? I think we're assuming that previous night okay. is like when all the charades went down and he just has been locked in his room since. And he was in, like, their room and she slept on the couch? Uh, we don't ever get clarification on that, really. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, something like that. And there is also a glass of antifreeze. So there's the bottle. What do you do with that? Antifreeze? It's, like, for a car. You put it in oh. your windshield wiper fluid or whatever. Does that, like, kill you instantly? Yeah, it kills you pretty quickly. And some antifreezes... Apparently, like the really old school ones, you could drink them and it actually tasted good, like like Gatorade. Is that a painful death? It is painful death. But oh. what they do now is they put stuff in the antifreeze to make it taste bad so that animals don't just drink it up and like... Or humans. Or humans and yeah. die. 
Um, so in the call to the welfare check, Stacy told the police that David had been very depressed the last few weeks. Obviously, she's going to say that. So police do a brief search of the house and they find one item of note. And this is just like a routine, quick survey of the house. They find a, a new, a brand new turkey baster in the trash. So they're like, oh, why would someone throw away a brand new turkey baster? The baster has small green droplets on it. And the droplets appear to be and are later confirmed to be antifreeze. You know what so a turkey baster went, is? Yeah. Okay. She, she shoved it down his throat when he was like drunk, passed out. That could make sense. That would be my she first She injected it into his rectum. That could make sense too, right? Yeah. I know women like use it to get pregnant when they're like... Do they? Turkey I've, just, I've seen shows where like they take the semen out of the condom and then they inject it. Like when they're trying to get pregnant by a man and trap them. Like football players or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Apparently antifreeze is for your radiator. It's not for the windshield. Flares. Yeah. I don't know about cars, guys. You know, it's nothing. <laughs> My dad would laugh at me if he heard me say that. I, don't, I think he would just be disappointed. You know? <laughs> he would. He would Actually, that is what he'd be. He'd be like, antifreeze isn't for the windshield. Uh, okay. So, uh, so homicide is now suspected, and the police begin collecting evidence. Now it's a crime scene. They find Stacy's fingerprints on all of the items and David's DNA on the tip of the turkey baster. And remember, the door was locked. So it's questionable as to how her fingerprints could have gotten on all of that. Yeah, you can lock it from the inside. Yeah. I mean, it's not that questionable to me because you could just have bought in the stuff and, like, you know, you were you drank it together Also, if you're going to do something like that, like, put on gloves, bro. Medical examiners conclude that David died from ethylene glycol poisoning antifreeze. Okay. Makes sense. Wait, where did they find the baster? In the trash. She's a idiot why yeah. would you just throw it out i don't like what is happening there i guess she's a terrible yeah. mom so she's just not you know she's terrible all around okay investigators get a judge to sign off on wiretaps for stacy's house i love wiretaps and just surveillance in general I would... it's not legal oh they got they, they got, got uh, approved yeah. <laughs> but i love it when they do it illegally they're like yeah we just had cameras in the house yeah, do they? It's only in shows. I guess we never really hear about people actually. No, I did a case the other day. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they also set up surveillance at home and the cemetery. And both of her husbands are buried next to each other, which I found that to be kind of weird. But they set up surveillance on the burial site. There, there's a deep antifreeze conversation in the chat. Is there? What are they saying? So antifreeze can be, you can buy windshield wiper, washer with antifreeze in it. It works great in the winter. That's it. That was a deep conversation. Antifreeze is for your vehicle. Um, you're cracking me up saying antifreeze. Am I saying antifreeze wrong? Ant no. Antifreeze? 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 Anti antifreeze? No, How do you say it? Antifreeze. Right? I say antifreeze, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Stacy, this is, I found to be funny, gets another teddy bear tattoo with angel wings sitting on a cloud on her other shoulder. So she's so she just trying two, to collect tattoos here, bro. Two tattoos. It's not even about the husbands. It's about the tats. Antifreeze. Someone says it's antifreeze. Antifreeze. I don't like that. Maybe that's just like a location. You know, like people say antifreeze in the Antifreeze. Someone said it's a Michigan thing. It could be antifreeze. I think my dad says anti. Oh, antifreeze. I've heard that before. Antifreeze? Okay. Antifreeze. No, I think it's anti, guys. Me too. <laughs> uh, okay, so David David's will gives everything to Stacy with almost nothing going to his son. And apparently him and his son were pretty close. That's suspicious. Someone said auntie freeze. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said auntie wrong. It's auntie, not auntie. This is a, I mean, I feel like auntie, auntie. is like a southern thing. Auntie? Yeah, auntie is a southern thing. That's my auntie. Or auntie is Indian. Yeah. We're getting too distracted, guys. Yeah. Okay, uh, wiretaps do not reveal very much. Call records, though, this is, I think, pretty interesting for the case. It shows that she only called the house one time before calling for the welfare check. Which, to me, if you don't have any knowledge of what actually happened at the house, you're calling multiple times, right? You don't just call once and then call welfare check. And he didn't have a cell phone or anything? 
Um, he probably had a cell phone. I don't know exactly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm calling. You're making a bunch of calls. Once, and then I'm waiting like ten minutes. Calling again. And then calling again, and then waiting. It, I wouldn't like worry until I got home and his the door was still locked and like. I obviously just wouldn't worry. Yeah, I feel like as much. I would not call a welfare check unless I called. 15 to 12. I would never call a welf welfare check if I didn't suspect anything wrong. Well, you just went to Whole Foods and I thought you were going to Publix, so I panicked. You did? Yeah, and then I had to call you. We picked up. This murder she ate is really starting to stress you out, I feel like. Yeah, of course. Uh, but another interesting thing that was noted from the surveillance, she did not visit the grave sites at all, which I don't know. What does that mean to you? Um, are they Thanks. far from her house? I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, am I visiting grave sites or am I just like that's, thinking about the person a lot and yeah. looking at pictures? That's my whole thing. I don't see a lot of, like, I get, if some people are into the grave sites, that's fine. If I could fine. like walk to it and it was like warm outside, I'd be like, oh, that's nice. I'll go do that. For some reason, my brain just doesn't understand the, the, the standing at a grave site. I wouldn't do that even if it was like you. It feels like my dad and I was really young, I would do it. Yeah. I think like because they're tra traumatized sure. and you, you want to spend time with your dad, I guess, or something. I don't know. Yeah, what is the percentage of people who go to their gra the grave sites? I don't know. So she's now the prime suspect. They bring her in. They ask her to finalize some paperwork with a wink and a nudge. What does and that mean? It means that they really want to interrogate her, but they're like, hey, come on in. Let's just wrap this case up, sign these documents, you know? Okay. But then as she's in there... They slowly start asking her more and more intense questions, of course. And she's like, okay, you guys think I'm the suspect. You think I did it. She asked to speak with an attorney. Okay. Of course. You yeah. got to do that. You, you do it off the bat. Exactly. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> so I hate when the cops do stuff like this because the honest truth is you should just never speak to cops without a lawyer because they do stuff like this. Even Well, they're supposed to say you have a right to an attorney. If which they probably did. If they're interrogating you. Okay. But if they're not interrogating you, they're just questioning you. They don't have to say Jack. Okay. You know, they yeah. would have to read you your Miranda rights first if you're like actually in their custody. So Stacy's oldest daughter is taken out of class to be interviewed. This is her first day of college, and she's told that both her father and stepfather were murdered. So that's kind of jarring to Ashley, the oldest daughter. She immediately goes home and tells her mom, Stacy. Which tips Stacy off to the fact that she is indeed the prime suspect and the police know that the two men were poisoned. So this is new information to Stacy. She's like, okay, cops know poisoning. Why happened. are the cops calling the daughter to tell her that? They're like, that's weird, right? It seems like a tactical error by the cops, yeah. Yeah, huge. You don't break that news, especially if you don't want the mom to know yeah. that she's the prime suspect. So that very night that the, the daughter went in for interviewing, the mom says to her daughter, they're sitting there, maybe 7, 8 p.m. at night, we've been through a lot these past few years. We need a night to celebrate. Her and her daughter, they're going to celebrate. So they start drinking, but Ashley, the daughter, thinks the alcohol tastes weird. Stacy keeps insisting that it's fine, this is just like a different kind of alcohol, you just got to keep drinking it, eventually starts tasting good. Nothing really happens that night. Eventually, Ashley goes to bed. Then the next morning, Ashley finds this to be kind of weird. Stacy wants to go right back to the drinking. Like we're in college, basically. And it was only Ashley drinking with her? Yeah, because the other daughter is too young. Okay, right. So they want, she wants to start drinking again. Ashley kind of gets starting, starting to get suspicious here, but continues drinking with her mother because she... Thinks her mother is a great person and is genuinely looking out for her and everything. Yeah, it's your mom. Yeah. Um, Ashley again complains that it does not taste good, and that is the last thing Ashley remembers. But that means she's not dead because she re remembers things afterwards. <laughs> um. What's up? We got, we're still talking about antifreeze over there. <laughs> True. Someone said true, but if you go to the hospital and you're on drugs, guess what? They they use it against you in court. I mean, if you go to the, I'm pretty sure if you go to the hospital, like you're getting your stomach pumped or like drug overdose or something, they don't call the cops. Well, you have to be in your right mind to be questioned, right? But like that, their main job at the hospital, you should never be scared to go to the hospital because their main job is to just make you better. It's not to rat you out, help you out. 
But yeah, she was in. It was her first year of college, so she's eighteen. Mm. Which um, is kind of young to be drinking, but no, were, it's not. I mean, yeah, but like with your parents, like I'm not going to be drinking with my kid when they're eighteen, or am I? Maybe I will. I don't know. Did I drink with my dad? No, I don't think. I, I might did. have had like a sip or like half a beer or something. No, I don't think I drank. Uh, okay, so Stacy says, so this is now talking to police. Stacy says, Ashley went to her room, closed the door, and wouldn't come back out. The younger sister finally discovers Ashley. This is Bree. She comes home, she discovers Ashley, her older sister, and notices something is wrong with her. She saw her sister was on the bed. She had a bottle of prescription pills and an empty bottle of vodka. She wouldn't wake up. The daughter immediately notifies Stacy, the mother, who notifies police. Okay? Yeah. In her 911 call, Stacy to the cops says she suspected her daughter had taken dozens of pills and drank a bottle of vodka, which you would suspect that based on the scene, right? Yes. There is a letter on the bed next to Ashley. It's long, it's rambling. It says, it basically continually reiterates how much she loves her mother and how none of this is her fault. Is it in her handwriting? It's typed. The letter also says how she is scared that her mother is going to end up in jail for something she didn't do. It explains how she, Ashley, the daughter, was actually the one that poisoned both her dad and stepdad with antifreeze. The letter is typed. And it's actually quite odd for a suicide note to be typed. Not... Unless it's staged by someone else. Because that's the only time you see it. Suicide notes are quite intimate. They're usually handwritten. She is rushed. Quite intimate. She's rushed to the hospital. Heart rate is over 170, and she couldn't speak properly. When Ashley wakes up in the hospital, the investigators they're actually kind of convinced that this makes sense. Ashley could have been the one who did all of this. They begin interrogating her. They keep Stacy separated. Stacy is outside in the waiting room. They have no contact with one another. So they first, right when she comes out of her like coma-like state, they start drilling her with questions. They're trying to be like, what happened with the letter? Did you write the letter? What? Tell us about the letter. Did you kill your both your parents? Like all this stuff, right when she gets out of the coma. Okay. And she's like, no, what are you talking about? I didn't do any letters. No letters. And they basically, based on their questioning of Ashley, they're like, okay, I buy what Ashley's telling us here. They arrest Stacy. They take Stacy in. They charge her with two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. Yeah. Um, okay. So while all of this is happening, not like this same day, but in the background as this case is building, they actually exhume Stacy's first husband, Michael, and she doesn't know anything about this. And the autopsy was performed on Michael, the first ever autopsy, because if you remember, the family didn't want one the first Except time. Except the sister. And we found out that it was antifreeze poisoning again with the first guy when they thought it was a heart attack. Stacy's taken to trial on January of 2009. She's charged with the forgery of a will. That's a new one they added in there in the meantime. Well, yeah, obviously. Why would David not leave anything to his son? David's original will left everything to his first wife and the surviving child. Really? So Ashley testifies against her mother, but the defense's whole case is that Ashley did it. Obviously, that's really the whole, the only real route you could go. Um, and Ashley was suicidal in the past because of like all of the deaths, like everyone around her is dying. So obviously that puts you in a certain mind state. She'd written letters to a boyfriend about thinking about suicide and she had a troubled relationship with both of the, the husbands. Right. That and she sense. was like the first person to, or like last person to see them, or at least the, the first husband. Yeah. She was there when he died. Right. So there's kind of a decent case against her. She was 11 her. though. But in the end... There's too much evidence to tie Stacy to the crimes. Plus, this is actually, this made me crack up. So she doesn't think antifreeze, which is funny that we're talking about this, is called antifreeze. She thinks it's called anti-free. Anti-free. So throughout the suicide note, it doesn't say anti-freeze, it says anti-free, like five or six times in the note. And then she's in interrogated by the police and in the courtroom, cross-examine, and she keeps saying anti-freeze. Oh my God. And everyone else is saying anti-freeze. So Dead it's like, away. it's obvious that she wrote the note because it says anti-free. So that was like a funny giveaway. And then uh, 
They also found practice suicide letters written under her profile on the home computer. And in the end, Stacy's found guilty of second degree murder, of two counts of second degree murder, and one count of attempted murder, second degree attempted murder, and forgery of a will. And she's serving 51 years until she'll be eligible for parole oh, at age God. 81. Um, I wonder what her thought process was when she was doing the practice suicide notes and then like they were found on her computer. Like, did she save them? I don't know. Like back in the day when XP, I remember had all the profiles. We, I would just use whatever profile was up. I didn't sign into my profile. Yeah. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean she wrote them, but they time stamped them and it was like always times when, oh, they were her, found under Ashley's profile. No, under the mom's. But it was always at times when Ashley was like doing things like practice, school, so it was clear that you could see it was Stacy. Yeah. I always no. Everyone in my family logged into their own. We were very private people. I think most people log into their own. Uh, she's dumb. And here's some additional info on the actual acts that was able to be found out during the trial. Hi, buddy. Um, and through the additional autopsies, Michael, the first husband, was given rat poison in addition to the antifreeze. So apparently he was not like he wasn't dying fast enough. So she gave him rat poison the day before or like the day he died when he started making the weird faces and stuff. And I actually learned, is it rat poison? It's just like vitamin D, like really high doses of vitamin D. I don't know. And it thins out your blood, basically. I think I read that somewhere. And David was poisoned, her second husband, over a four-day period. Stacy fed David antifreeze with a turkey baster while he was unconscious. And with Ashley... This makes me think of the sixth sense. Remember the stepmom was poisoning the daughter? Yeah. And she dies? Yeah. Ashley was drugged with sleeping pills first, and then she was spoon-fed vodka and prescription pills over the course of 17 hours. This is so weird. What is what's wrong, Juju? And that is the case, guys. Hi. What's new with you guys? Yeah, this one wasn't as much of a mystery. Honestly, it's hard to find really good mystery ones. Yeah, but it was it was a good one in the sense it was um. Hey, come on. Red poison has arsenic in it. Someone uh. said. Can you do Gypsy Blanchard? Pumped for the show to come out. Oh, I don't even... Do I know about Gypsy Blanchard? I don't know if I do. Why didn't the mother of the first wife want... The first husband? Yeah. <laughs> Julius. I guess they just assumed hey. it was a basic heart attack. And if it did cost money, then... Julius, come on. Be good, be good. Apparently they Julius, also wired her come phone, here, come here. and while she was talking to a friend, you could hear her typing on the keyboard. Really? Yeah. Oh. What's the best time of day to take collagen? When you wake up or whenever? Whenever? Um, I, I think just whenever. Someone just told me this was an awesome two-hour 2020 episode. Ours? Uh, oh. It wasn't two hours, but yeah, thank you. Can you do sardine recipes? I don't do recipes with sardines. I just eat them out of a can usually. But like I've seen people make like sardine patties. I want to actually try making homemade sardines one time. And I just got a bunch of cabbage. I don't know if I mentioned this before. I'm going to make sauerkraut. Maybe we'll have a recipe. Did Stacy ever admit to the murders? Or was she just charged? I don't think she ever admitted. She pled not guilty. Okay. That dog sucks. <laughs> Someone said. <laughs> he is... That's yeah. funny. A he little sucky at times. He is sucky at times, that's for sure. Um, do you... We are trying the keto diet and having a challenge getting over the toxic hunger. The toxic hunger. What does that mean? So, is it actually... I don't I guess I've never heard the term toxic hunger, but... Is that just like a lot of hunger? I think what it is, is actually just your craving for the foods you typically eat. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, crunchy stuff, snacky foods. You're not satisfying that really. It's a lot of habits. It's not necessarily like true hunger. 
But yeah, I mean, just eat keto foods until you're satisfied and stick with it. And then in about like two weeks, I'd say that subsides a lot. Sauerkraut, water, salt, your done. Your screen is so bright. Um, do you Dude, plan so. on finding the sex out of your baby? We do. You don't soon. find out for some weeks now, though. Pretty soon, right? I think four. Yeah. Everyone, please show your love by giving them a thumbs up. Oh, thank you. You guys don't need to show us your love, though. This one's honestly, this, this thing we do is just purely for the love and the fun. You just said you don't have to show us love. This is for the love and the fun. I mean, it's for the, our love of doing yeah, it. Yeah, we, we for are forcing kind of... this on you. You're yeah, not exactly. You're, <laughs> you know, we're not like, you're not asking us to. Um, Someone said you're not eating enough fat. Yeah, that could be one one cause for hunger, too. We'll definitely do Jean Benet Ramsey at some point, just like. That might just be a group big boy we do. Yeah, it's not even that. I mean, one of us probably could just do it, but. Oh, did you guys see they're doing a new Adnan thing? Is it on, yeah, is it on HBO or what is it on? Uh, yeah, maybe HBO. I think it's a four part series. Yeah, that looks on good. Adnan. That is definitely an interesting one. That's, yeah. Because people are really diehard in their opinion on that one. I don't know. What do you guys think about Adnan? Guilty or innocent? Meet up anytime soon? Not, I don't know. I've been wanting to do like a laser tag meetup. I thought that would be fun. Because there's this place by us that's like tactical warfare laser tag. It's not just your standard one. You have to do headshots and you have to look down the site for it to be accurate. Yeah. It's pretty fun. We got one innocent. The lethal injection is just a super high dose of potassium, so I get scared to take supplements with it in there. A lot of people say an innocent. Who? Ednon. Oh, I thought someone's... I thought we were talking about Michael Jackson, because someone said Michael Jackson do it. <laughs> I don't know anything about that, honestly. Um... You guys can do conspiracies and or unexplained historical or scientific events. Yeah, I'll probably mix one of those in at some point. Maybe like a cult type of thing, too. Yeah, that would be fun. A laser tag meetup would be awesome. <laughs> laser tag is so sweaty. We will definitely do Stephen Avery. Did I tell you guys about the worst laser tag experience of my life? We went just at some rec center around here. We played uh, laser tag. We all got tickets. And the guy, for some reason, the, the person running the laser tag, is like, what do you guys want to do? Everyone for themselves or teams? And the, some lady just screams. She's like, everyone for themselves. Which, you know, when you first hear the options, that sounds kind of enticing. But when you actually think about it, you're just all running around and you're just constantly shooting each other like this close. It's just like everyone's. Yeah. It's so it's unfun. Fun. Um, I listened to the Serial podcast so long ago. I can't remember. Yeah. This HBO series is going to be a good refresher. Did Megan change her hair part? Oh my God, yes. Middle. It's only been like <laughs> like four days. Um, but yeah, I changed it to the middle. I'm just giving it a try, bring it, trying to bring it back. But I don't hate it, so I might just stick to it. Thank you for noticing. Seems like most people think Adnan's innocent. We got one guilty. I think he's innocent as well. Okay. I think he's guilty. That's but good, I don't though. think we he should, should be in jail. Sure. I, don't, I don't think there's enough evidence to put him in jail, for sure. No, not for first degree. No. What do you guys think about Stephen Avery, guilty or innocent? Guilty. Yeah. I think he's guilty. Have too. you guys done an escape room? Yes, we have. They're pretty fun. They're yeah. okay. They're, yeah, after doing like three under my belt, I'm like kind of over them. I'm kind of over them, too. That's another thing. Like, 2025... 20, it's just going to be commercial real estate available from shut down escape rooms and vape shops. If I could like, I don't know, is there any way to invest in the, the decline of escape rooms and vape shops? Yeah. A lot of people saying Avery's guilty, guilty. Everyone's saying Avery's guilty. Okay. I thought more people thought he was innocent. Did you ever think about doing bangs? I have before, and like I remember, my friend did it for me, and I cried because it was so bad. Really? I just I have such I have like chubby cheeks, and like it's really circular, so bangs don't look. Good. I think bangs look better on like a leaner face. 
All right, we should call it, guys. Should we have had fun? This was fun. But I want to take care of Julius. He's like stressed and stuff. I hate doing escape room. Someone said. Yeah. Fine. I think I think Stephen Avery is guilty, but definitely shady cop stuff. Yeah, I can see that too. Uh, we love you guys. We um, we'll see you next week. Same time, same place, different meal. <laughs> All right, guys. Wait, are you gonna you're gonna be gone next week? Oh, but yeah, you might do it alone. I don't know about that. Oh this God, is our thing. Part is so not middly. This is our thing. Can't do stuff alone. You can't fix it in like a computer that's backwards. I'm just gonna not do it. Um, War Games Atlanta is cool. Is that where we went to? War Games Atlanta? We, no. 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 Do you guys want? Vote now. Do you want Matt to do it alone next week? Well, of course they're going to vote for that over nothing. <laughs> um, we also got a video coming tomorrow. Yeah, that's it, guys. And if you guys want to, like always, if you comment after this video gets posted, you can comment cases you want us to do for next week or, you know, just in the future. Yes, do comment that. after the video's been posted. Yeah. All right, see I'll you guys. I'll say yes. Bye. <laughs> no. <laughs> Someone said no. So this is a hell no. All 